Chapter 25 Halt! The anguished cry was torn from Will as he urged Tug into a full gallop. Reaching the still figure lying in the long grass, he threw himself from the saddle and knelt beside him. Abelard stepped nervously beside his master, his head down, trying to nudge Halt with his muzzle, looking for some sign of life. The little horse nickered constantly, but there was a whine of anxiety in the sound, a note that Will had never heard before. Still, Abelard, he said quietly. He gestured with the back of his hand to wave the horse away. Get back, boy. The horse wasn't doing Halt any good, and his stepping and nudging could only get in the way. Reluctantly, Abelard paced back a few steps. Although he would normally only respond to Halt, he was intelligent enough to recognise that his master was incapacitated and that Will was next in the chain of command. Reassured by the calm tone of Will's voice, he stopped making the small, distracted noises and stood still. His ears were pricked upright, however, and his eyes never strayed from Halt. Holt was lying face down, and gently Will rolled him over. He moved the cowl back from Holt's face. His eyes were shut and his face was deathly pale. He didn't seem to be breathing, and for a moment Will felt a surge of horror rush through him. Holt's dead! It couldn't be! It was impossible! He could not imagine a world without Holt in it. Then the still figure gave a shuddering sigh and began to breathe again, and Will felt relief flood through his system. Horace arrived, swinging down from the saddle and dropping to his knees on the other side of the fallen ranger. The concern was obvious on his face. He's not, he hesitated. Will shook his head. He's alive, but he's unconscious. Holt gave vent to another shuddering breath that seemed to shake his entire body. Then his breathing settled a little, but he was breathing raggedly and taking only shallow breaths. That was why, Will realised, he was being racked by those great shuddering sobs every so often. He needed the extra oxygen in his lungs. Quickly, he stood and removed his cloak, folding it to form a makeshift cushion. Lift his head, he told Horace. The tall warrior gently raised Holt's head clear of the grass and Will slid the folded cloak under it. Horace lowered Holt's head onto it. He studied the still form of the ranger, his sense of helplessness showing on his young face. Will, he said, what do we do? What's happened to him? Will shook his head, then leaned forward and gently raised one of Holt's eyelids with his thumb. There was no reaction from the unconscious ranger. But as Will studied his eye, he noticed that the pupil remained dilated, even though the day was relatively bright. He knew that it was an automatic reaction for the pupil to close down when exposed to sudden bright light. Apparently, Holt's system wasn't reacting to normal stimuli. What is it? Horace asked. He hoped that the fact that Will had done something, anything, was an indication that he had some idea of what the problem might be. Again, Will shook his head. I don't know, he muttered. He allowed the eye to close again. He put one finger on Holt's throat, feeling for the pulse in the large artery there. It was fluttery and uneven, but at least it was there. He sat back on his haunches, pondering the situation. All rangers were trained to administer basic medical treatment in the event of a colleague being wounded. But this was beyond bandaging and stitching. This wasn't a wound he could isolate and... A wound! The moment he had the thought, he was reminded of Holt's constant rubbing and scratching at the minor wound to his forearm. He gripped the sleeve of Holt's jacket along the line that he had stitched up only the night before and ripped the stitching apart, letting the sleeve fall back away from his arm. The bandage was still in place, 
A slight stain showed on it where the blood had seeped through the material before the bleeding had stopped. He leaned forward and sniffed lightly at the wound, then recoiled hurriedly with an exclamation of disgust. What is it? Horace asked quickly. His arm. It smells foul. I think that might be where the trouble lies. Mentally, he berated himself. He should have thought of that sooner. Then he dismissed his moment of self-criticism. The wound had seemed like a minor one. There had been no reason to suspect any connection between it and Holt's current behaviour. He drew his throwing knife and slid the razor-sharp edge under the end of the bandage. Abelard rumbled a warning. It's all right, Abelard, he said, without lifting his eyes from his task. Settle, boy, settle. Tug moved to stand close to his companion, brushing against Abelard and offering comfort and support. He nickered gently, as if to reassure Abelard that Will had the situation well in hand. Will wished that he felt the same confidence. He slit the bandage and lifted it away from Holt's arm. The cut ends opened easily, but where the bandage lay over the wound, it seemed to have stuck. That puzzled him a little. He didn't think there would have been enough blood from the wound to have dried and stuck the bandage in place like this. He was loath to simply rip the bandage away. He didn't know how much extra damage that might do. He put a hand out to Horace. Get me a canteen, he said, and the tall youth hurried to fetch the canteen that was tied to the saddlebow on kicker. Abelard was closer, but in his current state of nervousness, Horace wasn't sure how he would react if he was approached. He handed the canteen to Will, who began to pour water carefully over the bandage, letting it soak through and loosen whatever it was that was causing it to stick to the wound. After a minute or so, he tugged gently at the edge and felt it give a little. Holt stirred, moaning quietly. Abelard whinnied. Easy, Will said gently. Easy there. He wasn't sure whether his words were addressed to Holt or Abelard. He decided he was talking to both. Horace knelt again, eyes wide and fascinated, as he watched his friend gradually work the bandage loose from the crusted, dried matter that surrounded the wound. It took several minutes soaking and gently easing the cloth away, but eventually it fell clear and they could see what they were faced with. Oh my God, said Horace quietly. The horror in his voice was obvious. Will made an inarticulate sound in his throat and for a moment turned his eyes away from the terrible sight of Holt's arm. The graze itself, which he might have expected to have dried and scabbed over by now, was still weeping. The flesh around it was coated with a discoloured mass of oozing, vile fluid. The rotting smell that Will had noticed earlier was now all too evident. Both young men instinctively recoiled from it. But perhaps worst of all was the flesh of the rest of the arm. It was swollen to almost half again its normal size. No wonder Holt had been rubbing and scratching at it for the past day, Will thought. And the entire swollen forearm was discoloured. A sickly yellow around the wound gradually gave way to a dark blue tone, shot with bands of livid red. He touched Holt's arm gently with one forefinger. The skin was hot to the touch. How did this happen? You cleaned and dressed the wound almost immediately, Horace said in a shocked, low voice. Both he and Will had seen their share of battles and their share of wounds in the past few years. Neither of them had ever seen anything like this. Neither of them had seen such a level of infection, for that was what this surely was, develop in a cleaned wound in such a short time. Will's face was grim as he studied the wound. Holt stirred fretfully, groaning and trying to reach with his other hand for the dreadful, 
discoloured arm. Will stopped him gently, forcing Holt's free hand back down by his side. There must have been something on the crossbow bolt, he said finally, and Horace looked at him, not comprehending. Something? Poison, Will said briefly. The sense of hopelessness and uncertainty began to well up in his chest again. He had no idea what to do here, no idea how to treat this terrible wound, no idea how to counteract the poison, for that was almost certainly what it was. Then he felt the hopelessness being submerged by a sense of panic. Holt could lose his arm. Worse, he could die here, miles from anywhere. And all because Will, his trusted protégé, the famous Will Treaty, renowned throughout the Kingdom of Araluen for his fast thinking and decisive action, didn't have the first inkling of what to do. He reached out uncertainly to touch that damaged arm and realised his hand was shaking. Shaking in fear and panic and from a sense of utter uselessness. He had to do something. Try something. But what? Again he faced the inevitable answer. He didn't know what to do. Holt could be dying and he didn't know how to help him. Do you have any idea what it is? The poison, I mean, Horace asked. His horrified gaze was fixed on Holt's arm. Horace was a warrior who faced his enemies in fair combat. The very idea of poison was anathema to him. No! I don't have the faintest idea what it is, Will shouted at him. What do I know about poisons? I'm a ranger, not a healer. The panic was threatening to take charge of him now and his eyes were blurring with tears. He started to reach out for Holt again, paused uncertainly, then drew back his hand. What was the point of touching him, of poking and prying at him? He needed care and expert treatment. Perhaps stirred by the sound of Will's voice, Holt tossed slightly and muttered something incomprehensible. Maybe we could clean the wound, Horace suggested. It seemed logical that Holt might feel better if that oozing liquid was cleared away. And clean water might soothe the swollen, feverish, discoloured flesh as well. With a giant effort, Will gained control of himself. Horace, as he so often did, had cut through to the heart of the matter. When all else fails, fall back on basic principles. Basic treatment for a wound was to clean it to wipe away as much corruption and poison as possible. That much he could do for Holt, he thought. And now that he had a clear course of action, he felt the clutching, debilitating panic receding. He held out his hand and looked at it. The shaking had stopped. Thanks, Horace. Good thinking. He looked up at his big friend and gave him a sad smile. Would you mind getting a fire going? I'll need some boiling water to sterilise the bandages and clean his arm up. Horace nodded and rose to his feet. I might as well set up the campsite, he said. I guess we'll be staying here for a while. I guess so, Will said. As Horace moved away and began to gather stones for a fireplace, Will became conscious of another pair of eyes watching him. He looked up and there was Abelard his head moving slightly from side to side. He uttered a subdued whinny as Will looked at him. Don't fret, Will told him. He'll be all right. He tried to put as much conviction as he could into the words. He wished he could believe them himself. Once the fire was lit and water boiled, Will set about the task of cleaning Holt's wound. He soaked pads of linen in the boiling water Then, after letting it cool a little, he used them to wipe away the pus and crusted matter around the edge of the wound. As he gradually worked, swabbing as gently as he could, he was rewarded by the sight of clean blood again seeping from the lacerated flesh. He thought that might be a good thing. He remembered hearing somewhere that fresh blood tended to clean out a wound, 
At least there was no new pus or discoloration forming. He dabbed the wound gently with clean linen until the faint flow of blood stopped. Then he applied some of the pain-killing salve that all rangers carried in their wound kits. It was highly effective, he knew, but he was always a little uncomfortable using it. It was derived from the drug Warmweed, and the faintly pungent aroma it gave off brought back unpleasant memories for him. At least, now that the wound was clean, the smell of corruption they had noticed before seemed to have abated. That, too, might be a good sign, he thought. He decided not to re-bandage the wound. Keeping it bandaged may have contained the poison and magnified its effects, he thought. Instead, he soaked a pad of linen in boiling water, then, allowing it to cool a little, draped it over the wound to cover it. If need be, he would hold it lightly in place with a loose bandage. He had soaked more cloth in cool water, and now he draped this over the swollen flesh further up the arm that had been so hot to his touch earlier. He thought that the swelling seemed to have gone down a little. He arranged the cooling cloths on Holt's arm and shrugged. That's all I can do for the present, I'm afraid, he said. You seem to have done a lot, Holt replied. His voice was weak, but his eyes were open and there was a little colour back in his cheeks. Whether it was the effect of the cleaning, the warm weed salve, or just coincidence, he had regained consciousness. This time, Will couldn't stop the tears as they flooded out of his eyes and ran freely down his cheeks. Holt was alive, and he seemed to be improving.